Hi, this is Matthew Kenslow, and the pathogen that I'm going to be talking about is Microcystis aeruginosa, also known as cyanobacteria. This is very special and close to home for me because this past summer, this is what I've researched as a biogeochemist for my undergraduate research. It should also hit very close uh, to home for you as well, since this is a major problem, especially in our state. So what are HABs? to start out with. HABs stand for harmful algal blooms. HABs occur when there is a rapid growth of algae and can be formed in fresh marine and estuarine waters. Cyanobacteria are planktonic photosynthetic bacteria, hence the prefix cyano because it's photosynthetic, and they are ubiquitous in aquatic ecosystems throughout the world. Cyanobacteria can produce a class of toxins known as microcystins, which cause harm to the environment and to humans. Essentially, you have the bacteria, which is the pathogen. The bacteria produces the toxins. The toxins produces the cyanohabs. And recall, just to make sure we're on the same page, microcystins are toxins that come from the pathogen that we're studying. Um, in this PowerPoint presentation, cyanobacteria, aka microcystis aeruginosa. And microcystins are specifically the toxic secondary metabolites that are produced by the pathogen. They are the most commonly observed cyanotoxin in the United States lakes. They are responsible for the illness of humans and animals. Microcystins are a class of heptapeptide hepatotoxins. Not even boiling can detoxify them. Just recall Needham in 1745 and Spallanzani a score later when they boiled the broth. Why'd they do that? Because they knew back in the day that that would kill uh, the microorganisms. It's why you heat stuff in the oven or put stuff in the microwave. I mean, if you're an Eagle Scout or if you're like me, an equivalent to the Eagle Scout, I mean, I earned the gold medal of achievement after like a decade, then you would know that you boil things to um, to kill off any bacteria. There's all these different methods, iodine tablets and so many other methods, but boiling is one of the methods to purify water. But it's not going to help you in this case. One laboratory test displayed that cyanobacteria can survive salinities of a maximum of 17.5 for nine days and only one study uh, show that they can survive seawater whose salinity is 35 average. Truth be told, cyanohabs have proliferated freshwater systems globally in recent decades in both frequency and intensity. All this due to a pathogen. Since habs can compromise public health and damage ecosystems, it is thus at the utmost importance to understand it um, uh, understand its cause, that is, and to prevent them from occurring. How do humans acquire microcystins poisoning from such uh, pathogen cyanobacteria? Well, algae are at the base of all aquatic food webs. In summary, fish and shellfish can accumulate cyanobac uh, cyanotoxins in their tissues via the consumption of toxic containing cells. Fish, birds, animals, and humans can thereby be exposed to cyanotoxins by way of ingestion of such contaminated um, organisms. In, in other words, the, small, uh, the big fish eat the smaller fish, the bigger fish eat the big fish, birds eat the fish, so does animals, and then we eat birds, animals, fish, uh, depending. Fish, birds, animals, and humans can thereby uh, be exposed to cyanotoxins by way of ingestion of such contaminated organisms. These events are responsible for the reduction of dissolved oxygen concentration, bad taste, and odor in drinking and recreational water that humans and animals use, thereby adversely affecting pets, livestock, wildlife, and humans. What is so alarming about microcystins? Adverse health conditions include liver failure, hepatocyte necrosis, hemorrhaging, and even death. At certain concentrations, cyanobacteria can produce the. At certain concentration, cyanobacteria can damage the liver, kidneys, and nervous system organs. 
According to the CDC, milder symptoms include eye irritation, nose irritation, skin irritation, throat irritation, and respiratory irritation. So prevention. To prevent oneself from becoming exposed to such pathogens and their toxins, the CDC says to avoid making contact with water that smells bad, is discolored, has foam or scum, or contains dead fish or animals. What to do if exposed? Well, there is no test available yet to treat have associated illnesses. But according to the CDC, if one is exposed and has symptoms, the CDC recommends to follow local and state protocol, call the local or state poison information center for advice, and consult a health care provider to relieve symptoms, and consult a health care provider for advice. What is one thing that we do know? A recent study showed that microcystins were detected in 37% of mussels in the San Francisco Bay's estuaries collected between 2011 and 2016, indicating that this phenomenon may result in the contamination of fisheries in the ocean. We do not know how often or where in Southern California that freshwater toxins are transferred into estuaries and coastal zones. The answer to how the pathogen, cyanobacteria, or microcystis aeruginosa, might have migrated to Southern California is that they probably latched onto shellfish, and these shellfish transported them from place to place. In the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, the concentration of microcystins grew to 2.9 million parts per billion in freshwater lakes, downstream tributaries which were one kilometer away from the ocean. Furthermore, 21 southern sea otters have died as a result to microcystins. These findings suggest that regions at the land-sea interface are at risk for the impacts of freshwater cyanohabs along with habs formed by marine species. So what causes cyanohabs proliferation? Natural environment variation such as drought, can cause cyanohabs expansion. However, human activity has also been the culprit, such as deforestation, urbanization, agricultural activities, and eutrophication. Recent evidence has shown that microcystins can be transported down watersheds from their freshwater origin to marine and estuarine environments at the land-to-sea interface thereby accumulating in coastal seafood and contaminating it. Cyanohabs used to just be confined to a few regions in the United States, but as a result to human activity, it now affects lakes, rivers, wetlands, estuaries, and nearshore marine waters across the country. Cyanohabs have proliferated worldwide in recent decades in both frequency and intensity. This can affect every continent except Antarctica. Here are the problems. Notwithstanding the facts that microcystins are deadly to us humans and animals and that, they, that they're at the base of food webs, the risk for seafood contamination isn't currently known, even in our area. We don't yet know the extent or magnitude of MCs, even in our area, nor have we any tools to monitor this yet. If and when we do find out that microcystins are common over here in SoCal, along with other places across the world, protocols must be set in place to quantify how much poison might be consumed by unsuspecting pescatarians. So looking into the future, scientists are working to optimize an efficient extraction protocol to quantify how much pathogenically induced poisons, which are the MCs that come from the pathogen that we're studying, in this PowerPoint, might be ingested by unsuspecting pescatarians. A major hindrance to studying this problem is that there is no standardized protocol and monitoring microcystins in bivalve tissues. Yet, and that is exactly what I've been working all summer as a biogeochemist. Scientists are working to, to 
quantify said microsystems and bivalve tissue matrices in a way that is sensitive and readily reproducible by other scientists. To start out, a technique known as liquid chromatography electrospray ionization tandem mass spectrometry is employed. The advantage of this is it providing specificity and good sensitivity. The protocols that scientists will develop and, e and utilize will be used to monitor cyanotoxins at the land -sea interface and to analyze archived tissue samples collected from local uh, estuaries to determine if microcystins are present in the shellfish that live in these locations. Thresholds for water exposure to microcystins due to the pathogen uh, that we're studying, uh, Microcystis um, aeruginosa, has been established for the state of California and nationally by the United States EPA. Currently, however, no national standards exist for microcystins in fish or shellfish tissue, but the state of California did establish that it is, uh, that it is safe to eat at the level of 10 micrograms per kilogram of tissue. Ultimately, uh, their research, however, may save the precious lives of both humans and animals. And here is my bibliography. Uh, thank you for listening. I very much appreciate it.